On my 30th birthday, Steph gave me a wonderful gift. It was a chance to fly a plane. Uh, it was a four-seater, so uh, she came along as well. After a few minutes, though, we discovered a problem. It seems I get dreadfully airsick. <clears throat> Shouldn't have been surprised. I get dreadfully carsick. After a steadily worsening flight, I pendulumed uh, into a landing with two questions in mind. One, why won't the runway keep still? And is that little window going to be big enough and close enough, if you know what I mean? <clears throat> it was a terrific thing that Steph wanted to give me, uh, but because of who I was, I couldn't enjoy it. All I could really have handled at that time were those little merry-go-round planes, that, you know, the ones that are on the wire and the... Yeah, OK. Um, the real thing just about killed me. I had to uh, lie down for the rest of the day. Well, it was a little bit like that for the Old Testament Israelites. Because of who they were, they could not yet receive what God had promised for them. It would kill them. Instead, he does keep his promise, but in a way that hints at what's or who's coming and how he was going to change them so that they could enjoy what he's promised. I'm just going to pray as we get into it. Heavenly Father, we do pray as uh, we have, we have you've spoken to us in your word. I pray that we might understand what you're saying to us, believe what you're saying to us. By your spirit, would you change us to be the people you want us to be in your dear son, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. What I want to try and do today, oh, actually be a bit helpful to have Hebrew, the Hebrews reading in front of you and, and the outline. <clears throat> what I want to try and do today is show how God does keep his promise to Abraham in the nation of Israel. And God has said, remember, I'll give you a big family and they'll become a nation and I'll be their God. They'll have their own land and, and there'll be blessings for them and through that nation, other nations will be blessed. The nations of the whole world. So yes, in Israel, that nation, ancient Israel, God, God does keep his promise, but it's, well, it's, it's disappointing. This Israel can't be what God had in mind when we look at their history. So here's where we're going to go today. So yes, Israel is the promise kept, but not really. The promise truly kept is Jesus. So how do we fit in? And what we're going to do is we're going to do that three times with three examples. First, with God's people, the Israelites, the, the, the people. Second, with God's place, the tabernacle or the temple. And third, God's rule and blessing under King David. We're going to use those three examples to, to really see uh, who Jesus is for us. So let's start with uh, God's people, the Israelites. Now, as I said, God's promised Abraham he'd have a big family and that he would then save that family out of slavery in, where was it? It was in Egypt. Save them to be his chosen people. Uh, and so he raises up Moses to be the one to lead them out. And as God's uh, giving Moses his commission, uh, he says to this, uh, he says, this is what you'll say to Pharaoh. This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I told you, let my son go that he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So Abraham's family don't know God yet, but he calls them his son. He brings them out of Egypt in a spectacular way, as we know, and he opens up the seas for them and they go in and to escape. And, uh, and he brings them to Mount Sinai and there he gathers this motley crew of distantly related people and relatives and he brings them into a nation and he calls them his own nation. Uh, later on in Exodus 19, he says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, even though the whole earth is mine. So God keeps his promise to Abraham and Abraham's family becomes God's people, the nation of Israel. But did you hear the condition? The if in what God says to them. Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special people. Well, friends, that did not go well. Hosea is a prophet God sends to his people a few generations later. 
And Hosea sums up Isaiah's, sorry, Israel's response to their God. He says, God says through him, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But Israel called to the Egyptians, even as Israel was leaving them. See, so from the very beginning, Israel will not be faithful to their God or his covenant. From the moment they're saved, they want to go back to Israel. Uh, sorry, to Egypt. And when, when God does bring them to the land he promised uh, to give to them, they refuse to go in. There be giants. We were like grasshoppers to them, says the spies. And so to that generation, God says, you will not go in. And for 40 years, they wander in the desert. And God uh, says of his people uh, during that time later on in Psalm 95, for 40 years, I was disgusted with that generation. I said, they are a people who hearts have hearts have gone astray. They do not know my ways. So yes, God does save his people, but they don't give him their, give him their hearts. On the whole, there is people by name only. So what do we do with God's promise to Abraham? He's kept his promise, but if Abraham had seen how it, was, how it came about, wouldn't he have been disappointed? Well, of course, God's not sideswiped, is he? Israel, as the people of God, was only ever a partial fulfilment, as we've seen, of that promise. Yes, the promise is kept, there is a people, but it's not the fulfilment. They're only a picture, a pointer of what's coming. Because there is a problem, a problem God hasn't, God hasn't dealt with yet. And until he does, God can only ever save his people. They honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Of course, that's the problem, isn't it? It's sin. That's the reason he doesn't have their hearts. Now, kids, uh, if you've got one of those blue folders, you'll have some questions uh, that I want you to answer for each of my points. Uh, so you just have a look at that first question and see uh, how we can answer that one. So Israel, as God's people, is a promise kept, but it's not promise kept fully yet. And this waiting, this tension, actually shines light on the fulfilment when it comes. Recently, uh, Steph and I saw uh, 1917, not a movie for kids. The language is pretty bad, and it's about World War I, trench warfare. Uh, it's a race against time. And I, and I know in my mind, and possibly I said it out loud a couple of times, mate, you haven't got time for this. Come on, get on with it. Uh, but of course, the storyteller builds up this tension so that the resol- you, you see the resolution so much more uh, because of the tension that's be- being built up. That is what God is doing uh, in his history of Israel. See, so when the, when the tension comes, when the uh, resolution comes, and the Gospels, Matthew, for example, is at great pains to show his readers that Jesus is the true Israel. He is the true son. Uh, an example, when Jesus is a baby... Um, his life is threatened, as we remember, so his parents flee and take him to Egypt. And Matthew tells us, there he stayed until Herod's death, so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, what we read earlier, out of, would be fulfilled, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, who was God's son earlier, what we read? Well, it was Israel, wasn't it? But Matthew quotes from Hosea, um, he now uses that of Jesus. Out of Egypt I called my son. And again, uh, God the Father confirms it at Jesus' baptism. Uh, Matthew uh, 3, This is my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Jesus is the son. He is the true Israel, the true God's people. Now what happens after his baptism? Well, he's sent out into the desert, isn't he, for 40 years? No, 40 days. But we're supposed to get that connection, aren't we? This time it's the true Israel in the desert. And to this Israel did God say, oh, there are people whose hearts have gone astray and they don't know my ways. No, absolutely not. Under severe trial, this true Israel, this true son, says of Satan, away from me, Satan. 
I will be faithful to my Father. See, in Jesus we have the true Son, the true Israel, who is faithful to his Father. That's good for Jesus. But what about us? How do we fit in? Jesus is faithful. But we're naturally like those other, those other Israelites, those, the other Israel in the desert, unfaithfully grumbling away, aren't we? But those who are joined to Jesus, the true Israel, the true people of God, they themselves become the true people of God. See, in our reading from Hebrews 10 today, if we look down at verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. That's all those who have put their trust and hope in Jesus. That's how we become God's people. Did you hear that, kids? This is your first answer. We become God's people by putting our trust and hope in Jesus. We're joined to Jesus, so perfected by Jesus. His faithfulness to God is given to us if it were our faithfulness to God. That's why uh, God's able to say a little later on in in Hebrews 10 there, uh, from verse 16, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds and I will never again remember their sins or lawless acts. See, Jesus keeps the condition that God gives to Israel at Sinai. If you will carefully listen, carefully listen to me and keep my covenant. And so God treats those joined to Jesus as if they have kept the covenant. So that's point one. Now that we've got the pattern, I think we will be able to speed things up a little bit. So let's go again. The new example. Back to these people who've been saved out of Egypt. What's the sign that God is with his people in his place with them? What's well, that tent called the tabernacle, isn't it? Or later on the temple. So in Exodus 40, 40 do, you, oh, do you remember that cloud that, uh, fo- that leads the people to the promised land? The cloud of, ex- of God expressing his, his, his presence with them. Well, in Exodus 40 it says, that cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses couldn't even enter that temple because the glory of the Lord was there. It had filled his place there. Well, it's a clear statement, I will be with my people in the place that I've given them. I'm keeping my promise to Abraham. But what does that look like? Well, we read before about the Day of Atonement. It's where God deals corporately uh, with the sins of his people. And on this day, Israel can actually enter physically into the presence of God. But friends, as we read, it's one man, once a year, for a few moments in a tiny little space. The sanctuary or the most holy place. But he's such an awesome God. Why such a small expression of his presence? Well, friends, the the temple is designed to keep people at a distance. See, for your own safety, the temple says, stay away. See, one person once a year may come into the most holy place only after his sins have been dealt with by the spilling of much blood. That reading goes on to say that, that, that only the sin can be atoned for by blood. You see, my people, says God, your sins will kill you in my presence. So kids, did you hear that? That's your next question for for, uh, section 2. God's people, Israel, couldn't come into God's place, the temple. Why? They would die because of their sin. Yes, God says, I'll be with you, but you need to keep your distance. He's a God worthy of such praise and yet his people can't truly enjoy him because of their sin. So he keeps his promise to be in his place with his people, but again, it's so disappointing, isn't it? It's a fulfilment of God's place, but we're not there yet, are we? Of course, I'm going to say something about Jesus now, aren't I? But how does that work if I'm talking about a person? Well, I think the Apostle John would be the person to ask here. See, at the beginning of his biography of Jesus, he says that, In Jesus, God has come and dwelt among us. Well, that word dwelt is actually literally tabernacled. 
God once confined his presence among his people to a tent or the temple. But in Jesus, he comes in the flesh. Jesus himself says, um, uh, he's arguing with some religious leaders about the temple. Uh, and he says, um, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. And the Jews said to him, the temple took 46 years to build and you'll raise it up in three days? But, um, says John, he was speaking about the temple of his body. So there's no doubt that in Jesus' mind, he is the temple, uh, he is the God's place. But what does that mean? How do we fit in? Well, we could say this. We could say Jesus says, it is me that you come to, to be in God's presence, to experience God. I am God's place now. Mm, But hang on. Didn't we just say on that Day of Atonement, didn't we say that the temple, the tabernacle, is there to keep people at a distance? If you enter God's presence, you'll die. Sinners die in the presence of a holy God. So what's different in Jesus? Well, as sinners, how do we enter the place of God, the presence of God in Jesus, without dying? We couldn't do that in the temple. What's different? Well, let's go back to Hebrews 10. From verse 19 there. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary, the immediate presence of God, through the blood of Jesus. When we are joined to Jesus, our sins are washed away. They're forgiven, done with. In Jesus you are no longer seen as a sinner before God, but as a faithful son of God, welcomed into his presence. You do not burn up in his presence. See, we're joined to Jesus by faith and his Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And joined to the Son in this way, we become sons of the Father, welcomed into the family of God. So kids, Jesus calls himself God's temple because he is where we, what was that four-letter word? Meet. We meet God. So that's point two. Up to point three. Let's just do it one more time. Back to Israel. Now they're settled in the promised land and they're at their pinnacle under King David. He's the man after God's own heart, remember? Chosen as God's king to rule his people and he himself is under God's law. David's the ideal king. He's faithful to God right up to his death. God puts all the enemies of God's people under the feet of his king. And through David, God gives rest to his people all around on every side. They can enjoy God's blessing of the promised land in safety and peace. But there is an enemy that David did not conquer. Of course, you can guess what it is, but here's an example. During his reign, David commits adultery with the wife of one of his own special guard and he kills the man to cover up the adultery. And then as he ages... Uh, David's family, uh, because of David's sin, actually, David's family uh, crumbles around him in moral failure and David does very little to cover, to, uh, to deal with it. David was a great king, but he could not save himself nor even his people from their greatest enemy. Of course, that's sin, isn't it? But there was a king who could save them. Do you remember that God had promised to David? What did he promise you will have a descendant, a son, who will sit on your throne forever. You see, the gospel writers again make sure by the time you have finished their books, you get in your heads that Jesus is this son, this son of David. The very first words in Matthew. Here's the family tree of Jesus, the son of David. But what can this son of David do that David, king, the mighty king David couldn't do? Well, let's go back to Hebrews. And grown-ups, the kids' question for this last point is, what did God's true king save God's people from? See if you can hear the answer, kids. So uh, Hebrews 10, verse 12. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, 
sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. See, this king, this Jesus, could not be beaten by this enemy. We saw that before when he was tested in the desert. That enemy, of course, is sin, and now he conquers it. He saves God's people from their sins. You hear that, kids? God's true king saves God's people from their sin. And how did he do it? By offering himself as a sacrifice. He dies in the place of sinners. See, this king has conquered and he's beaten our sin. It was the enemy that stopped us from being God's people. It's now conquered. It was the thing that cut us off from God's place, his, his presence. That's now conquered. Our sin meant that we did not want God's rule. So it also cuts us off from God blessing us. But Jesus has now conquered as God's ruler. And for those, of course, who are joined to the king, nothing now stands between us and the peace and the rest that God intends to give us. How does the king say it? In Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Not rest from war like God gave through King David, but rest for your souls. So to conclude then, uh, you'll notice we haven't had really had much application today, have we? Uh, we've been talking about what God has done for us in Jesus. Um, not so much our response, except to uh, believe in the one he's, he's sent and to put our, our trust in the one he's given us. But God does give us another application. Back to Hebrews, one more time. Verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, and I'll skip down to verse 22, let us draw near. That is our application today. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let's hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are faithful. You are faithful to keep your promises ultimately in Jesus, the one who conquers all those things which kept us from you, our sin. Father, might we draw near you to you in boldness, in humble boldness, uh, because we are now made pure before you in Jesus as he takes our hand and leads us to you. We thank you in his name. Amen.